Elevate. Okay, let's see how long it lasts. Oh. That, that hasn't gone then. Oh, I did warn you. <laughs> you did? I didn't believe you, but that's not even tried, has it? Yeah, that's, that's really not worked at all. In all fairness, it's not supposed to work on metal, but what can we learn from looking at it now? It's got to penetrate the surface. This obviously hasn't done, so it's not going to work on metal. You can peel it off quite happily. That's why it doesn't stick, and that's why you don't fly in aeroplanes, metal aeroplanes that are stuck with this sort of glue. And wood glue like that wouldn't have worked on concrete either. It simply couldn't have stuck the sails together at the Opera House. Take two. Glue like Castor's denture epoxy, and apparently it's so much stronger that a much smaller area of glue should hold, even okay. on metal. So that's a quarter of the area. Quarter of the area with the sticky stuff applied. Let's see. Bring it in. Okay, well, let's stand well back and give it a shot. Well, that's clearly that's holding. quite happy, even though it's rocking. The Opera House was then the biggest construction ever to have used epoxy glue. The same epoxy that keeps teeth rooted in dentures sticks the ribs of the Opera House together and guarantees that they won't slide against each other when heating swells and cooling shrinks the concrete. The skeleton was complete. Now it needed a beautiful skin. Utzon wanted a distinctive surface, worthy of the waterfront position, one that reflected the constantly changing light. A Swedish manufacturer spent three years developing tiles specifically for this building. There are more than a million tiles on this roof, and Utzon asked for two types, matte and gloss, and they were laid in intricate patterns, and then fixed to thin lids made of chicken wire and concrete, which were then fixed to the concrete ribs, and the roof of the Sydney Opera House was complete. But while more fearless workers laid the tile lids on the building, behind the scenes, the project was in turmoil. The architect himself wasn't around to witness the completion of his iconic roof. In a furious dispute over rising building costs, Utzon walked away from the project in 1966. But construction continued. Ove Arab's engineers moved on to the next challenge. Windows. Utzon wanted concert goers to be able to see and enjoy the building's spectacular location right in the heart of the city on the harbour front. But there were three problems. The size of the windows, the shape of the windows, and the fact that you risk killing people if you use ordinary glass. Just as the shape of the Opera House sails demanded innovative ways of assembling concrete, those same curves created new challenges for the window construction. The holes to be filled weren't square, and they curved. And perhaps above all else, they were huge. Not really like windows at all, more like vast glass walls. Nobody had ever done anything like this before, not on this scale. The designers wanted massive windows to allow the light to flood in, but big panes of ordinary glass are weak. Relatively small shocks can shatter them. Nobody wants four meter high windows falling onto opera goers. It took a deadly threat back in the First World War, poison gas, to point to the answer. Without gas masks, it just wouldn't have been possible to build Utzon's opera house safely. The same invention that would prevent the glass eyepieces from shattering and blinding soldiers will come in handy when making Utzon's vision a reality. To see why normal glass is not such a good idea, either for gas masks or the Opera House, I visit one of the biggest glassmakers in the world. 
Glass expert Susan Lamberth of Saint-Gobain has got a big sheet of standard glass for me. OK, well, this is um, a piece of 10 millimetre thick float glass. It's what we make here every day, float glass like this. So what might you use a piece of glass like this for? Um, it could be typically used in, in windows and facades and some roofs and things like that at this, uh, at this size and this thickness. So this is just a big piece of standard glass as it comes out of the manufacturing plant just over there. Over there, exactly. In its most basic, in its most form. basic form, yeah. This is good glass as used in ordinary buildings all over the world every day. We're just going to smash, I mean, test it. These are important. This is part of the whole test. Uh, we'll just put these down here for now, I think. OK. <sighs> Meet our opera goers. I'm going to drop a tile about the same size as the ones on the Opera House from more than 10 metres. Remember, in reality, the Opera House is 55 metres high. Here it goes. Please hit it. Yep, it's fine. Not a scratch. You see, this is good glass. But of course, everything has a limit. Now for the big one. I'm not actually being as brutal as it might look throwing a brick through our window because I've done the maths and this brick from this height, 11 and a half metres, onto the glass will have about the same impact as one of the roof tiles falling off the tallest shell at the Sydney Opera House onto a piece of glass. You see, it's sophisticated. I just need a brick. Below! Sorry, I broke your window. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's go have a look. I feel like I should say, can I have my ball back now? Oh, oh it's gory. Things don't look good for the watermelon audience. No, they the don't. Has. The thickness of that glass, I mean, that was a substantial piece of glass. It was, yeah, it's pretty, pretty gruesome. That glass is perfect for everyday use, but at Sydney Opera House, this would have been carnage. There is a solution as used in World War I gas masks, laminated glass. Amazingly, it uses exactly the same standard glass with one tiny little difference. Back at the factory, the glass starts its life in a fiery furnace where the raw ingredients are mixed and baked. 800 meters later, the continuous sheet is cut into panes. The secret is to make these panes into a special sandwich. A thin film of plastic polyvinyl butyl, or PVB, is sandwiched between the two panes of standard glass. The result? Laminated glass. And this whole process of making a glass sandwich was discovered by accident. Rewind to a French laboratory in the early 20th century. A clumsy scientist knocks over an empty chemical flask. Miraculously, it doesn't shatter. Nobody has cleaned the glass. The broken flask holds its shape because of an almost invisible film of sticky cellulose nitrate inside it. The idea of laminated glass is born. Cut to the First World War. Troops need protection from deadly poison gas attacks, so the gas mask is born. But as we've seen, bombs and shrapnel mean standard glass in eyepieces can create the kind of splinters which can split watermelons. Laminated glass sees action 